Though she is very young, she is an international person because she was born in England and uh, she, uh, she studied art history at the University of Valencia in Spain and Islamic art history at the University of Bamberg in Germany. And today, she is doing her PhD studies at the University of Zurich. Yeah. I really appreciate it very much. Uh, maybe I can <laughs> <laughs> And her PhD studied within the research project, Mudecharissimo and Moorish Revival, Trans-Cultural Exchanges Between Muslims Christians and Jews in the architecture of the Middle Ages and modern times. The title of her PhD thesis is Redefining Concepts, Sephardic Architecture in a tra Transcultural Context. And the title of her uh, lecture is the synagogue of a transitor of Toledo and great synagogue of Florence, Mudeja, and neo moorish architecture. So please take the phone. Good evening. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present part of what would be my PhD thesis in which I'm planning to investigate how the medieval Sephardic synagogues of Spain have been defined, diffused and received during the Spanish, European and North American 19th and early 20th century. This research is part of a major project which started in June 2014 under Professor Dr. Wiese's direction, Mudejarismo and Moorish Revival in Europe. A multidisciplinary team works on the exchanges between Muslims, Christians and Jews in the Middle Ages and modern times in an architecture. From a transcultural and diachronic perspective, one of the main focuses of the project relates on to the ongoing discussion about the term Mudeja, to which I hope to modestly contribute today. At this point, I would like to quote José Amador de los Ríos, the, so to say, father of the concept of Mudeja in architecture, and make his words mine. To ask humbly that you listen friendly and fatherly to my insecure words and distrusted assertions. And also thank in advance the audience for every comment that I hope will help me in my investigations. Since its formulation, the concept of Mudejar has generated great debates. When Amado de los Rios was appointed member of the Royal Academy of Fine Arts of San Fernando in 1859, he gave a speech that would amend the national historiography, the Mudejar style in architecture. The concept of Mudejar, which originally was a term referring to the social and institutional status of Muslim population living under Christian rule, would be applied to architecture. It was a formulation with a positive impact on the recoitaneous research, as we will see, but it also resulted in some defining problems and contradictions, which will be referred to in this paper, attending to its application to the synagogue of Samuel Halevi, called of El Transito. Examples of the transmission of the Mudejar theory 
and the name Synagogue of Toledo in Europe will, given, will be given, comparing the Spanish and the European treatment of the Sephardic past. On the other hand, next steps in my investigation will be <coughs> resumed, which will deal with the question of whether the Spanish political and cultural development, especially after the Progressive Revolution of 1868, contributed to the heyday of the neo moorish synagogues. For this purpose, the example of the Florentine synagogue will be referred to. Medieval history and its artistic and architectonical legacy received a great attention during the 19th century, when nationalism and romanticism lived its heights. The research and classification of this legacy was extremely relevant because it was considered that, and I quote, the monuments of this arts and literature are printed with a special stamp of the civilization that produced them." End of quote. Through this legacy, many characteristics of a society could be glimpsed. The conviction that the Zeitgeist, the Weltanschauung and the Volksgeist had a clear trace in the arts and of a certain territory prevailed and was extremely important to define national identities. Amador de los Rios' thesis about the Mudejar architecture led to the gradual reconsideration of a past which was generally rejected by the influent reactionary hierarchies, precisely in a moment in which the Spanish nation was being defined. He was introducing the reconsideration of a set of monuments with Spanish Islamic aesthetic as idiosyncratic of the peninsular late Middle Age and its incorporation to the national art history. It was after a turbulent time in which liberal and reactionary periods alternated with phases of constitutionalism and authoritarianism after the reinstatement in 1814 and abolishment in 1833 of the Inquisition and the autos de fe, when the ideological opening was initiated on a political and cultural level. Some Spanish intellectuals, among them Amador de los Rios, tried to demarcate Spain from the obscurantist image prevailing within and beyond Spanish borders, recovering medieval history as an ally for their liberal ideals. The idealized concepts of Reconquista and Convivencia were set and considered the origin of modern Spanish national identity. After 1859, the Mudeja would be understood as its genuine artistic expression. It constituted a channel through which the interest in the heritage of Al-Andalus was promoted among Spaniards, justified by the fact that also the reign of Castile had built in the so-called Arabian style, reflecting Christian's victory among the Muslim enemy, their supremacy and tolerant attitudes. The Mudejar was seen as an art, and I quote again, that has no analogy in other meridional nations as either the tolerant policy of the Castilian crown is comparable to other nations' policies." End of quote. So the definition of Mudejar architecture has to be understood within a series of ideological, political, and cultural interests <coughs> and problems. But which characteristics are inherent to this type? We only have the following definition given in 1859. It is an architecture that was generally commissioned by Christians to Mudejar master builders and that owed a special aesthetic resulting from the junction of Islamic and Christian constructive and decorative elements. So three elements seem to be required to define the building as Mudejar. The first one is construction in Christian territory. The second, a conscious adoption of Spanish Islamic aesthetics. And the third, the commitment of Mudejar master builders. <laughs> this concept was thus delimited principally by a religious and national distinction of which the main agents were Christians and Mudejares. Where was the Jewish contribution to this to an idiosyncratic art of the idealized convivencia led. Even if Amador de los Rios was aware and recognized the cultural legacy of Sephora, he followed the idea of a branch of European art historians saying that Jewry lacked of the, of the art of architecture. According to him, 
the synagogue of El Transito should be considered Mudejar because Jewry would have relied on Muslim building masters that were living under Christian rule. The revision of the synagogue stating has contributed to the reconsideration of this fact. When the synagogue was traditionally dated between 1355 and 1357, researchers like Cecil Roth or Juan Carlos Ruiz Sosa have dated it in between 1359 and 1361. It means that its construction coincided with the coup d'etat against Mohammed V in Granada and the interregnum between 1359 and 1362 of Mohammed VI. That the interregnum caused a new wave of Nazareth migration into Christian territories and a new wave of artistic exchanges suppose, supports the hypothesis of Nazareth contribution to in the construction of the transito. So if the nationality of the workmanship is a defining feature of the architecture, the classification in Mudejar's style bounds to fall short in the case of Samuel Halevi's synagogue. But also if religious criteria are applied, the concept of Mudejar seems to be inadequate. How can the Jewish connotation of the building be included? It is true that the synagogue shows a combination of features that interlaces motifs and fashions attributed to both Christian and Islamic styles. Christian sovereignty was expressed through the inclusion of Pedro I's coat of arms. Leaves in a typically Gothic fashion can also be found in between elements attributed to Spanish Islamic stucco works, among them the use of Arabic epigraphic vegetal and geometric motifs like the sepka or the spandrels made in a stylized and schematic fashion, which are shown in this picture. It is true that there is, that there is a stylistic parallel to other buildings constructed by Christian patrons, like the hall of the Casa de Mesa in Toledo, coetaneous to the referred synagogue. And yet recent research asserts that some aspects remain specifically Jewish, not only the incorporation of the great epigraphy and the spatial configuration, but also, as the PhD thesis of Daniel Munoz has shown, the interpretation of the synagogue's decoration as visual expression of the Jewish cosmology. The shared formal vocabulary, vocabulary is understood by researchers like Chris Sotha as a result of an overlapping of aesthetics within a period marked by transculturality and hybridity. But how was it understood in the 19th century by Spaniards and Europeans? After 1859 and during the second half of the 19th century, it was a formal vocabulary, vocabulary that was named Mudejar among Spaniards and Moorish among Europeans. One of the European travelers, the Baron Jean-Charles Davillier, advised in his voyage in Spain about the recently established concept of Mudejar. Amongst others, so he wrote, the Casa de Mesa is one of the, I quote, most curious Moorish buildings of Toledo, belonging to a style of architecture that in Spain has been given the name of Mudeja. When he described the synagogue instead, he did not hesitate to characterize it as Arabic, affirming that it probably was built by, and I quote, Muslim workmen, because the style of the ornament remembers very much to that of the halls of the Alam. Why was such a distinction made between the Casa de Mesa and the Synagogue of El Transito, two buildings with extremely similar vocabularies? Could ideological connotation be read from this di differentiation? While the distinction between Moorish and Mudeja styles was important for Spanish intellectuals, as it supported the thesis of the Convivencia in the debate against Catholic conservatives, such a distinction might have been secondary beneath Spanish borders. Did the idea of the Jewry as Orientals in the West prevail over the idea of Convivencia in Davinier's description of the synagogue? Was thus the similarity between El Transito and the Alhambra a confirmation of the Semitic and Oriental, not specifically Sephardic affiliation of Jewish monuments? By the time of W's journey, the Moorish revival had had a great presence in European architecture. It constituted a mixtum of ori Oriental styles that reflected the dichotomy between East and West. Decorative patterns of Moorish monuments, especially of the Alhambra, 
were transmitted to Europe by travelers and scholars who collected their observation in travel books, drawings, or catalogues of Arabic decor. Not only Islamic monuments, but also Jewish buildings have been documented, as for example, Karl von Dibich's drawing of El Transito Synagogue shows. <laughs> Architects, and soon also the Jewish communities, advocated for using the neo moorish style in the construction of new synagogues as expression of Jewry's oriental origins. As in the case of the formulation of the Mudejar, a religious and nationalistic meaning was given to the ascription to the Moorish revival. It was intended to find an architectural expression of the debated Jewish identity and Jewish art. The question about the Spanish connection of neo-Moorish synagogues has been the focus of scholars like Harold Hamashenk, uh, Karol Krinsky, or Ismar Schorsch, leading to both positive and negative affirmation. Even Davidson Kalman has argued more recently that even if the widespread and rapid association of the neo moorish synagogues with Al-Andalus and the Sephardic paths is critical, one could argue for, the, for a quoting of, a Sephara, sorry, of Sephardic synagogues of Spain and European synagogues from 1870 onwards. In the case of the Florentine synagogue, the case of the Florentine synagogue could serve as an example. Here, the original idea of building in a neo-Renaissance style was rejected by the Academia del Arte del Diseño in 1872 because, I quote, a building with the said function must manifest at first sight so effectively a marked character that it recalls the dates and the places that are of most interest for this religion a point of view that the Jewish community shared. So it was a neo-Moorish monument instead of a neo-Renaissance, which was built between 1874 and 1882. The facade and the ground plot adopted a Byzantine Arabic inspired appearance, while the inner decoration related very much to the Alhambra as transmitted through Owen Jones' publications. This that this synagogue was thought as a compendium of Jewish most important historical periods and geographies is clearly legible amongst the Academia's work and the architectural decoration too. Did the synagogue refer to the Orient as a world or did it also establish a Spanish link? If so, was Al-Andalus and its monuments preferred or was instead Sephardat and the medieval synagogues visually quoted? Were were special Jewish features of synagogues like Samuel Halevi's known and quoted, or was it instead the comparison to the Alhambra that was transmitted by travelers like Davillier, which led to the incorporation of the aesthetics found in Owen Jones' publications? The statement made in 1858 by a member of the Turin community, Gostala, highlighting the Jewishness of the medieval synagogues of Spain, despite the assimilation of Moorish styles, might contribute to these reflections. Oh, sorry, this is the comparison. The most celebrated rabbis raised for their own religious practices, temples using the same style as those famous religious and secular buildings of Cordoba, Seville, and Granada, a style that, besides, was also in harmony with their artistic genius and their temperament, seeing that it was a style that derived from the Orient. <coughs> Both the Academia's and Guastala's words might bring to mind those quoted at the beginning of this paper, pronounced by Amador de los Rios in 1859. A nation's character and history is reflected in its monuments, and no equi equivalence can be found elsewhere. According to this, the idiosyncratic architectural style of Spanish nation should be the Mudeja, as expression of the Reconquista and Convivencia. Few years later, the Academia and Guastala claimed for the, the consideration of the neo-Moorish style as ide idiosyncratic for Jewry, as it resumed key events in its history. The assumption that after 1870, European synagogues could have referred to separate is a part of the dates and the places that are most of most interest for this religion has to be challenged considering its immediate context. Is there a correlation of the Academia's and Guastala's statements 
with the Spanish political and cultural development, marked by the progressive revolution of 1868 and the claims for religious freedom on the one hand, or the creation of the Comisión de Monumentos, which catalogued and protected Spanish monuments, and, its re and the declaration in 1877 of the Transito Synagogue as a national monument, this will be the next steps in my research. Thank you very much. We will uh, have our questions and remarks later. Dr. Vladimir Levin. Uh, Vladimir received his PhD from the Hebrew University of uh, Jerusalem. Currently, he is the acting director of the Center for Jewish Art at the Hebrew University, and he is a teaching, uh, a teaching fellow in the Ben Gurion University of the Negev. He is one of the co-editors of the two-volume Synagogues in Lithuania, a catalog, and a co-editor, co-author of a new book, uh, which will be published uh, so, <laughs> And the name of the book is The Synagogues of Volinia, Northwestern Ukraine. His lecture, is entitled Between History and Architecture, Eastern European Synagogues. Uh, thank you, Rafa, for the presentation of me. And <clears throat> um, so the, the title of this paper, which was formulated when uh, the conference, this conference was announced was uh, between history and architecture, Eastern European synagogues. But uh, to, uh, today I would like to change it only slightly <coughs> and to speak about Eastern European synagogues in Siberia. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Less than a week ago, I have returned from an expedition of the Center for Jewish Art which documented remaining synagogues in Siberia. Our expedition started in Tomsk and traveled 6,000 kilometers to Vladivostok. Now it's a small lesson in geography. We documented synagogues, Jewish cemeteries, Jewish houses and Jewish objects in local museums in Tomsk, Marilinsk, Achinsk, Krasnoyarsk, you can follow here. I mean, uh, Achinsk, Krasnoyarsk, Kansk, Nizhny Udinsk, Perkutsk, Babushkin, Kapansk, Ulanude, Borguzin, Petrovsk, Dekalski, Chita, Habarovsk, Birebidzhan, and Vladivostok. Uh, so, using this fresh documentation, I would like to discuss the connection between history and architecture in those remote areas of the Russian Empire of the 19th and early 20th century. Jews settled in Siberia during the 19th century as convicts banished from their hometowns and exiled to those remote areas as a punishment. In the mid-19th century, some Jews arrived to Siberia as soldiers in the Russian Imperial Army, including teenager uh, draftees known as Cantonists. Only in rare cases, Jews who have privilege to live outside of the pale of settlement moved to Siberia in the second half of the 19th century. The connection between Eastern Europe and Siberia could be demonstrated with the help of a book we found in the old synagogue in Birobidzhan. It's all, this old synagogue was built in 1986, uh, so it's relatively old. And this book of Hafez Chaim, you can see it uh, there, it bears a stamp of the Beit Midrash Nechalat Israel and the new plan area in Kovda in Lithuania, which you can see here. And this, uh, this, the history of this synagogue and its architecture was researched and published by the center in our catalog of synagogues of Lithuania and you can check it outside in the, in the table with books. Um, of course, we may assume that this book arrived to Birobidzhan with Jewish settlers in the 1930s or even after World War II. 
However, the connection between Siberian communities and Jewish centers in the Pale of Settlement were quite good in the 19th century, too. The clear proof of the transfer of Jewish traditions from the Pale of Settlement to Siberia is the old Jewish cemeteries in Siberian towns. The tombstones there are very similar to those found in every shtetl in Eastern Europe. The images on these stones are very similar to East European ones. However, there are some local features. For example, in some towns, the graves have to be protected from wild animals, like here in Berguzin. In Eastern Europe, you usually don't do it. The most striking difference from Eastern Europe is the early appearance of family names and of inscriptions in Russian. In a small East European shtetl, there was no need to mention a family name, and the Russian language has not been wide, uh, widespread among Jews. Thus, Siberian Jewish cemeteries demonstrate a combination of East European tradition with adaptation to uh, uh, the Russian surroundings. Jews constituted from 6 to 15 percent of the population in many Siberian towns, numbering between several hundred to several thousand people. Such population size was significant enough to provide for the continuation of Jewish traditions, but made integration and acculturation <coughs> inevitable. Similar, uh, but we, since we have a session about synagogues, I will uh, speak about synagogues and not about the synagogues. First synagogues in Siberia were built of wood in the mid 19th century. None of them survived, but it's possible to suppose that they were quite simple, like this one in Sreti. There are no exterior signs which may designate this building as a synagogue. The wooden synagogue in Nikolaevsk, built around the same time, looks like a synagogue in the Pale of Settlement. The building is clearly divided into parts. The prayer hall with high windows and women's section on the upper floor. In the late 19th century, and especially in early 20th century, synagogue architecture in Siberia became more elaborate. Probably the earliest synagogue, the depiction of which is known, is the wooden synagogue in Krasnoyarsk, built around 1878. It is already clearly distinguished from other buildings. Besides a large star of David, it has a large gable with two smaller ones, thus presenting itself as a public building. A strange globe above the gable should signify, as it seems, the religious nature of it. About the same time, a magnificent synagogue in Irkutsk was erected. It also has a large number of gables, but also pilasters and never windows. In 1881, a cupola was added and the synagogue was in a great. After the Kutsk, the cupola became the most widespread feature in Sib uh, Siberian synagogue architecture. Some synagogues, like those in Irkutsk, Ulanude, Omsk, or Kabansk, had cupolas above the entrance. Others had cupolas above the Torah, like those in Tomsk and in Petrovsk. In Kansk, Yeniseisk, Mariinsk, and probably Kainsk, the dome was situated above the prayer hall. After the revolution in 1905, when uh, the, um, the political regime changed a little bit in, in the empire, the number of cupolas in Siberia grew, and the synagogues in Tomsk, Ashansk, and Chita, all built in 1907, have three domes each, one above the prayer hall and two smaller domes back in the entrance. None of the large domes survived the Soviet period. Only in Achinsk and Chita, the smaller domes are preserved, and only in Chita, the original cupolas are intact. Thus, the majority of non synagogues in Siberia had cupolas and domes, which designated them as sacral places intended for worship. In Eastern Europe, in contrast, only rare synagogues had exterior, exterior cupolas. While East European Jews found it important to print domes in the interior of the prayer halls, those domes were rarely visible from outside. The synagogue with cupolas were modeled mostly on the synagogues in Central Europe, especially in Germany. The most outstanding synagogue with cupola in Russia was the Coral Synagogue in St. Petersburg. And most probably, Siberian communities looked onto it as a model. In other words, Siberian Jews modeled their representative buildings not after synagogues in the small towns of the Pale of Settlement, 
but after the synagogue in the imperial capital and even in Rome. Another feature taken from St. Petersburg synagogue and from Central Europe was the neo-Moorish or oriental style. In contrast to the previous uh, paper, I should say that it takes time to find it here, a brochure published in 1909 about the history of this synagogue, and this is a soldier's synagogue in, synagogue in Tomsk, it states that the new building was erected in 1907, I quote, in the Moorish style. <laughs> we looked at this building and found, couldn't find any signs of it that Moorish style, besides the cupolas of strange form. At the end, we found stylized Moorish arches. Here, yeah. you can see it. <laughs> applied to wooden pilasters under curtains. The use of this detail allowed to define the synagogue as Moorish. <laughs> In other words, to be declaratively modeled on the synagogues in the capital. Another example of partial implementation of Moorish features was found in Petrovsk Zabaikalsky. Only one window there, a window above the Torah Ark, was made as a horse, uh, horseshoe arch, thus paying lip service to the Oriental style. In Chita, the local architect simply copied the Moorish side towers uh, from an unrealized competition project for the St. Pe Petersburg Synagogue. Compare here. Here. Uh, this design of St. Petersburg, unrealized St. Petersburg synagogue, uh, was published in, in, a architect, in an architectural periodical in 1881, so it was easily accessible. The Chita architect took from that competition project also the form and decoration of windows. And, but I must say that he was not alone. <coughs> the architect of synagogue in Elizabethgrad in Ukraine, in today's Ukraine, used the same elements on his design. <coughs> Only one of those windows has survived an extensive Soviet reconstruction of the building in the uh, 1930s. Uh, we must say that architect in Chita, we still don't know his name, he also used some other forms with oriental flavor both originating from the recently excavated sacral architecture in the ancient Middle East. Um, another example uh, uh, showing the opposite. In the small town of Achinsk, the architect uh, Vladimir Sokolovsky from Krasnoyarsk rejected the orient oriental ideal and chose neo-Romanesque as the style for his synagogue. In reality, his magnificent building seems a mixture of large temples in Breslau and in Hanover, built by Edwin Opler some 30 years uh, before. Thus, we may to conclude in this stage of research, and it's only uh, the, the very first initial stage of this research, that Siberian communities were eager to follow the architectural fashion and to model the houses of prayer, prayer after those in the Russian capital and major uh, German cities. In this way, different significantly from the majority of the Jews in the Pale of Settlement, who preferred quite different solutions. The Siberian Jews tried to behave as the Jewish elite in St. Petersburg and a Jewish elite in the large cities in the Pale. They high economic status, they were convicts in the beginning, but uh, a good portion of them developed to be large merchants and very, uh, uh, very wealthy people. And their good relations with the surrounding non-Jewish population and administration allowed them to present themselves as a prominent and affluent group. Indeed, the synagogues in Siberian towns, and especially in the small ones, were very dominant structures. Two-story high buildings with domes towered among single-story wooden houses. In many places, the synagogue was the highest building in the town after the Russian Orthodox Church. But while churches were systematically destroyed by the communists in the 20th century, many synagogues survived. Both prominent buildings were used as offices of local administration. The dominance of the former synagogues in the cityscape is felt even today. Unfortunately, we don't have enough material to discuss the interior of those synagogues. None of them survived the Soviet period and conversion of former synagogues into administrative offices. 
However, the only two existing interior photographs in Irkutsk there and in Kabansk, and Kabansk is a small town behind, uh, on the eastern side of Baikal, also show the orientation toward, toward St. Petersburg and Central Europe. If we look at the Irkutsk photograph on the right, the photograph of, uh, of terrible quality, of course, we will notice that the Bima is situated in front of the Torah Ark. You can follow uh, now. So here we see the Bima. In a much better photograph from Kapansk, uh, the Bima is not very visible, but at the center of the podium there stands a covered table with a Torah scroll on it. So it's here. So we find that in uh, two cases out of two, uh, the Bima is situated in front of Torah Ark. The reform movement never arrived to Russian Jewry. Only several elite Russian synagogues called Progressive or Choral adopted some external features characteristic for German reform, including the placement of the Bima in front of the Torah. As these two photographs show, the Siberian Jews, or at least part of them, adopted that progressive mode. Because of shortage of time, I would like to discuss only one ritual object, and Bill is not here because I promised him to discuss ritual objects, <laughs> uh, which we found in Siberia, and I would appreciate the comments from the audience about this object. In the Museum of Ulan Uden, which got, as it seems, all the movable objects from the closed synagogue in that town, we found two strange furniture items. So they are similar. So they are uh, definitely intended to support Torah scrolls. Such objects are, are known, as far as I know, only in synagogues in Italy and Provence, but I don't believe that even one of Italian or French Jews arrived to one of them. <laughs> the usage of this object became clear when we found in the same museum an interior photograph of a synagogue in Kabansk, which we saw before. Uh, these objects are flanking the Torah and Torah scrolls are placed uh, in, inside of them. The question is why you place Torah scrolls in such supports uh, next to the elaborate Torah arc which we have. Uh, a possible explanation could be found in the above mentioned brochure about soldiers in Evoke and Tomsk. That brochure which stayed with it in Moorish style. Uh, the person who wrote this brochure was the only, the only Jew who started as a private and ended up as an officer in the Russian army. And he was one of the heads of that synagogue. And he mentioned that in the 1880s, some 10 years or more after the establishment of the synagogue and building of the synagogue, I quote, Wooden supports were replaced by an elegant art for the Torah scrolls. Unquote. Thus, it seems that in Siberia, the synagogues were initially built without Torah arcs, and those wooden supports were used to keep scrolls until a real ark was constructed. Mm -hmm. And after that, again, supposedly, those supports could be used during the reading from the Torah. To conclude this paper, which is, as I said, the only uh, only a first step in the research of Jewish art and architecture in Siberia, I would like to stress again that East European Jews who arrived to Siberia mostly against their will succeeded to preserve many traditional features. At the same time, they integrated very well into the Russian milieu of Siberian towns and accumulated significant wealth. Jews occupied a prominent place in those towns and didn't conceal their Jewish identity. Some of them would erect their private houses in Moorish style and place the Star of David on the facade, like here in Krasnoyarsk. This is the same architect who probably who built the synagogue, uh, Neoramonask synagogue in Hachim. Others would simply integrate the Star of David into traditional Siberian wooden decoration, like here in Kabansk or in nearby Babushkin on the shore of Baikal. Integration, rational acculturation, and prominent place in local society caused the Jewish representative buildings, the synagogues, 
were built according to the models accepted by the Jews in the Russian capital and by the Jewish elites in the Pale of Settlement and oriented even uh, to the Jews abroad. The Siberian Jews adhered to East European patterns, but mostly in their elite form. And I would like to finish my talk with a personal note. For me, it was the first, uh, the first research trip through the area which was not affected by the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. However, the state of preservation of Jewish heritage in Siberia doesn't differ at all from that in Eastern Europe. There are synagogues rebuilt by the contemporary communities headed by Chabad rabbis with various degree of authenticity. authenticity, authenticity. Yeah, you see, for example, the synagogue in Tomsk, it was restored according to the postcard, existing postcards, but inside it was made completely new. There are synagogues, all in dilapidated form, which have some prospects for renovation in the future, like this amazing wooden synagogue in, synagogue in Tomsk, which every window has uh, 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 Star of David, Magen David here, or, uh, not in this is wooden, or this building uh, in Mariinsk, which was built of wood. But there are synagogues which may be dismantled for wood this coming winter, and if they survive, they will disappear in a year or two, like this wooden synagogue in Kansk. Thank you very much. His special interest is in the link between architecture and ideas, synagogue architecture and Judaism's influence on modernism. He is the author of eight books and a co-author of four additional books in the field of architectural history of modern <coughs> times. He teaches at the St. Istvan University in the Evil Mikolos Faculty of Architecture in Budapest. And his uh, lecture will be about synagogues, forefathers of the architecture of reconstruction. Thank you, Raha, very much, particularly for your effort to pronounce my faculty. <laughs> <laughs> There's no mouse. <laughs> 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 I was really delighted to receive the invitation to this conference because of its topic. Um, I like very much to uh, ponder on, on what we have done so far, how can we put it into a, a wider architecture and cultural context. And this is going to be uh, my task here, although it is not meant to be a lecture for Schlapsch today. <laughs> so the conference um, to construct and deconstruct Jewish art is somehow turned upside down and uh, I would like to see what is the contribution of synagogues, if any, to the idea of the architecture of a deconstruction. As the problem of um, deconstruction and Judaism was mentioned yesterday, I will uh, skip uh, this issue and go directly 
um, to the architectural part of <coughs> the problem. Um, so we are skipping the Rida, we are skipping uh, negative theology, uh, which uh, uh, stands uh, behind uh, the Rida's deconstruction, and concentrate on its architectural manifestation, which could be summed up, uh, first of all, as decentering, losing or, or um, eliminating the center, introducing some disruption, some uh, fragmentation, um, introducing discontinuity, on purpose mismatch of uh, uh, different elements, mismatch between the elements themselves and between the elements and the whole. Uh, and probably the most important consequence for architecture is the dissolution of style as a, a firm package of, of form backed by a certain ideology or zeitgeist. And then uh, the practical uh, results, grotesque, multiple reading, and the strong anti-classical anti -classical sentiment of the construction. Here uh, I quoted uh, Daniel Liebeskind, who uh, tried to read back the Bauhaus into the ark, into the book, into the tabernacle, which is, um, Daniel Lipeskin uh, is considered to be a good theoretician among practicing architects and uh, a good architect among theoreticians. Probably, <laughs> probably he is between the two disciplines, most like me, uh, but with more success. <laughs> Um, Eidos. Eidos is probably a key notion um, in all these endeavors of deconstruction and all the endeavors of uh, architects. Uh, today I heard the term uh, Jewish born that I uh, like uh, very much. Because Eidos is uh, the idea, the unity between idea and form. And this is exactly what Jews have been fighting in the last a couple of uh, thousand years. Uh, this form is uh, supposed to be a spatial and a temporal. Uh, we Jews live in space and time, so it is absolutely against us. Uh, these, uh, the idea of Eidos is that all pieces of art are converging to an ideal uh, condition uh, similar to uh, Platon's uh, thinking. Uh, Platon's Socrates, he, uh, Socrates was the one who said that uh, uh, the forms are the essential basis of all the reality. And then we have um, a bit earlier period when our uh, forefather Abraham uh, destroys uh, the idols. Um, I would also say that he deconstructs uh, the idols because in this case it's not a mere defense near destruction, but it's a paradigm change, and then the term uh, deconstruction may apply. And this is the last uh, scheme that I'm going to torture you uh, now. So we have the idea of Eidos, a firm link between idea and form. The, we have the Jewish or biblical paradigm, it doesn't sound really sound, uh, let's say anikonism and the idea of disrupting the idea. There are ideas and there are forms, but there is no uh, direct link that we can uh, uh, connect the two. Then we have the Zen paradigm, which says that there is form, but there is nothing behind, there is just emptiness behind. Then we have the modernist paradigm, which hints via negative representation or any other way to some uh, other reality. And then we have deconstruction, which um, destroys, deconstructs these uh, links and introduces parallel readings. So this parallel reading is going to be the major of this uh, talk on cinema. Uh, here I'm just chutzpah to put Platon, Winkelmann, Hegel, and Andrei Alexandrovich Damm, uh, people who are familiar with uh, social realist art and Stalinism, know that Zhdanov was the mass, most important ideologist uh, behind social realism, which was the last really compact artistic movement that used the classical paradigm. So, and Putzpa, but uh, Putzpa is also part of uh, the construction. Uh, Christian representations of 
Babel. The Babel is very interesting because uh, this is um, a representation which somehow visually uh, precedes um, the architectural expression of deconstruction. And it goes grandiosely. The first uh, tower of uh, Babel by Lucas van Falden, Falken Borch is a more or less tectonic building, a conus with uh, parallel uh, layers, actually with uh, floor over floor, like a, a big uh, wedding cake. Uh, the next um, representation also from Falken Borch is already a wedding cake that was already attacked by some not very disciplined uh, children and it is in the process of uh, deconstruction. Now Peter Bruegel produced three uh, images. The first one is already a big innovation vis-à-vis uh, -vis Falkenborch because he introduced the spiral line which is a very important element in all this so you lose horizontal. And all the construction and architecture, if you go with the taxi here around Ramadgan, you will see all buildings <laughs> tilted. Uh, they just take some elements. So architects are not really uh, people who uh, read philosophy. They see some elements and then they introduce it and uh, make a composition. So this uh, was an inspiration for many of them. And then the next Peter Bruegel representation is uh, already going into the building and into this idea of uh, destruction, deconstruction. Here you have already one of the most important elements of deconstruction, the clash between different parts of the building. So below you have a building part which is circular. Over that you have something which is rectangular. And there is no transition. Uh, probably the most important parts of uh, uh, sacred uh, buildings in, in Western architectural history are the parts that make the transition between the rectangular and the circular. It is the pendantive uh, squinches, so this is something that is here sabotaged and you get something that will be later uh, termed as deconstruction. And the last is Cornelis Antonisch, the fall of the Tower of Babel, where you have this uh, moment of uh, destruction. Now you would say, um, uh, I'm mixing up two notions, destruction and deconstruction. Uh, probably I'm not mixing them up because uh, destruction is just a physical act of an object, of a culture, and deconstruction is a paradigm change which may have a destruction, like what is Islamic State doing now in Iraq and in other countries, or may not have a paradigm, uh, 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 um, visual manifestation like this building of uh, Peter Eisenman, which is actually would have been two skyscrapers like the twins in, in, in New York. It is much, much, much before 9-11. Uh, and he uh, deconstructed the two towers as they melted. And you can read it as a, as a kissing pair. You can read it as, uh, as uh, two gravestones. So there are this, this is this idea of, of uh, multiple readings, and this would have been the Max Reinhardt house that he never took really seriously. You can't uh, build this building, it is just a concept. And then uh, the Babel motif uh, goes on from uh, Borromini to, to Sri Hecker. Uh, this building is quite close, a walking distance from here. Uh, this is probably the most exciting, really uh, constructed uh, uh, spiral, it is called uh, the spiral which, it's very important to stress, preceded uh, the theory of deconstruction for some three, four years. So Hecker was ahead of uh, his American colleagues of Peter Eisenman and uh, Daniel Libeskind. Here uh, between we have a 19th century um, representation. Um, there is a version of uh, Guggenheim Museum which has a very similar uh, composition. And here we have uh, Vladimir Tatlin and uh, <coughs> international. Now, going back to the problem of being eidetic and non being eidetic, uh, here we have um, the Western Christian Church, uh, which has its uh, form derived from the cross. On the left hand side, we have synagogue uh, history from antiquity, medieval period, Sephardic. This is what we just have seen here, Francisco, 
Ashkenazi. We have early modern period in both areas, and we have 19th century, the big uh, melting pot of uh, synagogue architecture. And what is really striking, that there is no form of visual continuity. The only thing that goes through this period is the idea of the Bima and the art and the spatial dynamics uh, between the two. Why is it so? It is because in Christian uh, sacred architecture, we have the scripture, uh, we have uh, uh, St. John's vision of the um, cargo of Jerusalem, the Via Sacra, Via Vitae, which corresponds to the floor plan. And as uh, from the Jewish text, we don't really have an explicit input. This input is sabotage. There is some. The forms are coming from the Christians. The forms are coming both uh, the architectural space and both uh, the architectural language, meaning the elements with which this uh, space is uh, constructed. Now, let's see how it works uh, on uh, three examples. Uh, Gothic uh, church uh, versus Gothic synagogue. It is highly unlike, unlikely that Jews didn't pay attention to uh, the principles of constructing a cathedral, and they uh, tried to go against it to deconstruct the idea in many ways. Horizontal uh, partitions of the church, M, N, O, P, Q, they are unequal, they are hierarchical. In the synagogue you have M, 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 so it is the same continuity. More importantly, in the lateral direction, you have a very a relatively wide nave and two aisles. In the synagogue, you have two naves which are identical and they uh, bisect the space in two parts and uh, define an axis uh, on which is the Bina and the Ark. The most important issue is that there is a focus number one and focus number two, and the seating and the whole dynamics of the space changes during the service. While in the church, more or less, save some processions, um, the view is uh, focused to the east, and there is really one uh, uh, strong point of the interior. And it is not only the issue of space and internal division. Here we have the Agnashul, and here we have a typical Radnica uh, city hall of uh, the Czech Republic, uh, showing that the synagogue on purpose uh, abandons any uh, reference to a church, and it takes uh, language elements from uh, the Christian uh, prophet in one. In the interior, uh, this we saw the floor plan, this is this axis, with all this hierarchical division, the imprint of the cross. And here you have the Atmanshul view towards uh, the ceiling, and the Pima, a box in box, which is again a, a special phenomenon in the space, that the space occurs inside the space. And then you have language elements uh, where uh, the cross is more or less omitted. So keystone is also here, but the keystone is much, uh, much smaller. Here there is a large keystone to avoid the cross. And this is fifth rib, which is interpreted by many architectural historians as the way to avoid the cross form. Um, I'm not going to enter whether it is uh, completely right or not. Uh, the Renaissance. Um, the explanation of the a nine bay or clustered colored synagogue uh, could be summarized into two major hypotheses. One is the Kraftsov hypothesis and the other one is the Hukka. The Hukka hypothesis goes that it is from the Zohar, so uh, the four columns are just the legs of the divine throne, which could be justified with a couple of synagogues that have so close the four columns that you even don't have the Bima between them. There are some like that, particularly in the Moravia, there is the Mikula one that I can't stand anymore. <laughs> Before 20 years I could. And then you have the system uh, of the nine bay, where these bays are more or less similar, and Grafsov explains mm -hmm. it with the Renaissance, with the influence of Villa Pando. In both cases, this goes contra the Renaissance church. Here in grey you have the Michelangelo San Pietro, and in red you have the Mahasha synagogue. 
So again, the most important motive of the church is a void in the center, surrounded by material. In the synagogue, you have material surrounded uh, by a void. So this uh, gives it a, a special dynamics, and it is also reinforced with structure. It's a very important uh, thing that uh, in rare cases in synagogue history, in the Renaissance and the Baroque, you have a firm link between the ritual arrangement and uh, the structure. Uh, this frame uh, later, uh, by late Baroque, neoclassicism falls apart and the Dima uh, stays alone and later it gets shifted to the east. So this reform is a very gradual process in synagogue architectural history which was preceded uh, by uh, structural changes. So here we have a typical cluster pillar color uh, synagogue uh, which is in Stupava and here we have um, a neo-Renaissance uh, church uh, that illustrates this uh, difference or a view from the western side a neo-Renaissance church but it could have been a Renaissance church and a synagogue which could have been built in the uh, 16th century but it was built in the 19th century in this very long uh, continuation of nine bay and uh, clustered color symbols. The great change occurs in the 19th century when uh, the synagogue adopts the plan of the church and the perpetrator is Ludwig Förster. It is his Lutheran church in Gumpendorf, which is a suburb of Vienna, now it is part of Vienna, not very far from West Bahnhof, the main railway station, which is a typical uh, Western uh, church with a longitudinal arrangement. It's a Lutheran church, not a Calvinist one. It is 46, 46. 53 is the Tempelgasse uh, synagogue in Vienna, and uh, uh, 54, 59 is the Doheim Street uh, synagogue. Uh, which is almost the same uh, floor plan as uh, the Protestant church. So now you got into a situation that uh, as the floor plan is the same, even the look is very similar, that the identity of the synagogue shifts from space, from a neoclassical, to architectural language. Uh, this scheme shows in the middle architectural language until the 19th century, which is shared by churches and synagogues. Uh, you see uh, the Worms synagogue has a similar entrance to the Worms cathedral. The same goes on. You can find elements of uh, the Alpha Schul and the cathedral in Prague and so on and so forth. And it goes until emancipation. Then space takes the Christian space and then architectural language, Budehar, takes over uh, as the bearer of Jewish identity. Moreover, um, in the 19th century, the period when you get different uh, layers of meaning, so this is one of the most important uh, ideas of reconstruction. For instance, the first, and if you read any paper uh, from the newspapers about the consecration of the 19th century synagogue, it will be written that it was Moorish style. It is 95% likely that you will encounter such a description um, regardless of the actual style of the synagogue. So the first code <coughs> is this Moorish that goes on. This is more or less the language, architectural language, decoration, surface. The second level, as Budapest at that period left the Christian cathedral, it was still being built and we were built it for 50 years, the synagogue somehow took over the role of the, of the cathedral with the two towers and the cathedral interior, which is the second code. And the third code is technology. Jews who own the, the steel mills, who were very much for, for modernization, and they stood behind modernity, modernity, not modernism, and the skylight is here, and the skylight is in the interior. A Catholic church would have never had uh, a skylight over the nave. And then it's again a naturalistic uh, representation of Gothic and Neo Gothic and the abstract uh, geometrical 
uh, ornament of uh, the Mutehar, which is actually uh, the construction of the narrative uh, surface. It goes also for the structure. Uh, the church shows exactly the tectonic role of the color, the capital that takes over the load from the, from the uh, Lancet arch. In the synagogue, all it is missing, this is a steel structure inside, and this is just a cover-up. So this is a technique to uh, decorporate, not to show the corpus, the tectonic reality of the building. It's a sort of burka over the real uh, structure. And this burka-like uh, uh, arabesque, it's, it's visible because you feel that, aha, uh -huh, it should be a steel beam, but it's also steel. And this is just a, a decoration taken from uh, Robert Cohen Jones' uh, book of the Grammar of the Ordinary. Moreover, this was done of paper. And now it's plastic uh, after the restoration. And you don't see the actual uh, steel structure, but here it is it's, it's a precise narrative. Big load, a dark stone. A, a bit less load, a lighter stone. So it's a complete readability of, of the building's uh, structure. So what Moorish style introduces, and this is the construction of the tectonics, is that uh, there is a layering. There is the actual uh, structure, and you have a surface uh, over it which hides it and contradicts its uh, uh, basic principle, vis-a-vis -vis the traditional uh, eidetic uh, link between idea and form. And this puts uh, Moorish style and all this 19th century uh, uh, synagogue uh, architecture into a, a historic uh, perspective. In uh, the medieval period and the tectonic period of architecture, everything is visible. These uh, buttresses show that there, are, there is a rift wall inside and it takes as if the horizontal load. It is not taking much of this horizontal load, but symbolically it talks about the tectonics of the building. Here it is all gone. It is either geometric appointment, or some poetry, or the Quran. And when you remove this, or you uh, um, take the plaster and uh, cover it, you get modernism. So, uh, first of all, you take the surface off the building, yeah? so it's an independent surface, and then you throw away the rest, and then you get this. Now, deconstruction, the real deconstruction is when you have different layers. And when I first saw this building, it is in Tokyo, I thought, hmm, yesterday there was an earthquake. <laughs> but it isn't. It isn't that. It, these are different readings. One reading is uh, the earthquake. The other reading is the origami. There is another reading uh, of the company who produces windows and who produces furniture. So this is this multi-layered deconstructed uh, uh, meaning of the building. Now this is my last uh, scheme, architecture of mosaic faith, mosaic architecture. I use this pen to show that the 19th century architecture, synagogue architecture, is without any uh, firm uh, um, formal um, preconception. It is um, like a buffet uh, meal. You take water from here, you take composition from here, you style inside, style outside, material, and you make your, your meal. And uh, if you are a good cook, uh, it will be a good synagogue. If you are not so good, uh, this is the majority of synagogues that are really lacking style. So this idea of lacking style means that the style as such uh, has been deconstructed. Our last speaker is Professor David Kasuto. David Kasuto is an architect who specialized in sacral and secular architecture. He has designed dozens of synagogues, schools, and private dwellings. He is the author of dozens of articles on architectural history and has edited several books. 
Professor Kasuto is currently an associated professor in the School of Architecture at the University of Pamier, having served also as the dean. And his lecture is entitled, It is not incumbent upon you to finish the task, Judaism and Material Creativity. Thank you, Bracha, <coughs> Ilya, all the public here. I am very, very grateful to Rudolf that anticipated my lecture and he said all what I intended to say. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Rudolf, for the beautiful lecture. Very, very. After I saw it, now I know what I intend to say. <laughs> I will be superficial because I will touch many synagogues during the history and I will try to understand what they mean. The title of uh, my lecture is uh, It is not incumbent upon you to finish the task, but neither are you free to absorb, absorb yourself from it? The Peavot ethnic of fathers. Uh, this uh, paper summarizes Judaism approach to aesthetics. Where is the Hellenistic world <coughs> so perfection as a foundation of beauty? Judaism never viewed perfection as a goal. Perfection is not uh, an end, rather the act itself is, is the end. This definition can be used to understand the concept of art in Judaism. The essential uh, element of Jewish art is whatever promotes consciousness of the sacred. This is also expressed in regard to the deliverance from slavery to freedom. The worst from the, of slavery is enslavement to one's artifact. The Jewish people were liberated in Egypt from their physical slavery and spiritual sla slavery at the same time. A people accustomed to temples of marble and travertine, to the architectural per uh, perfection of uh, peristyle courtyards surrounded by monumental columns. Okay, not the right way. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Now it's okay. By monumental columns, the dwarf, those who stand next to them, uh, to titanic statues that resemble divine sentinels, the people went out to the exposed, blazing and empty desert. There they gave freely of themselves and their wealth to provide the materials for the uh, tabernacle.
<clears throat> blue, purple, and crimson yarns, fine linen and goat's hair, tanned ramskins, and so on. Uh, this was the temple, the, 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 the tabernacle in the desert. Uh, the tabernacle is a work of art assembled from material that are ready to hand and it put together by human hands. It does not strive for perfection, rather it is collective work on, of art uh, that can be taken apart and assembled it is portable and therefore not attached to specific place. Its concept of place is dynamic, not static. The stasis of the Egyptian temple was replaced by a dynamic sanctuary that moved from place to place as the Israelites journeyed through the wilderness. The tabernacle was not the work of a single man or of a single uh, inspiration, but the fruit of the combined labor of the entire community. The responsibility for transporting it from place to place fell on an uh, entire tribe of Levites. In contrast to the prevailing practice of the ancient world for the Israelites' art was a collective social endeavor and this was the source of its power. The temple that would uh, later be built in Jerusalem <coughs> was a surrender to the spirit of the age and environment, not a product of Jewish thought. Inside the tent of meeting in the Holy of Holies, there was no portable statue but an ark that contained two tablets inscribed on both sides. The first commandment written on it is, I, the Lord, am your God, with the uh, unity of the divine. While the second, uh, uh, the, the second commandment was, you shall not take for yourself a sculptural image, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. Uh, prohibit the making of an image to which one could become enslaved, like the idols that uh, surrounded the Israelites until those commandments were given. The first uh, synagogue and churches were built in almost the same era during the Roman Byzantine period. But the churches which took the place of the temple symbolized the temple in the liturgy performed in them as well as in the building design. Uh, also the decor and status. Those are the first churches. Uh, on the other side, and we see here the, the iconostasis that uh, was the place to which the, uh, the people looked towards and uh, uh, direct themselves. Uh, by contrast, synagogue, as their name suggests, uh, the Hebrew term uh, Beit Knesset literally means house of assembly, are places for gathering with a functional public purpose. Also, they also taught the performance of the liturgy, they are designed primarily for meeting. <coughs> this is why church sitting is frontal, Uh, facing the liturgical performance. Uh, synagogue seats, by contrast, are circumferential, turned towards the central space that is used to discussion, dramatization, study, and yes, for prayers sung by choir or other ways. We again encounter the emphasis on the community and time 
in the synagogues of the Mishnaic and Talmudic era, the use of the zodiac. Uh, the use of the zodiac as an ornamental element expresses the succession of seasons that is God's control of the cosmic order. The images serve as a functional end, unlike the decorations of churches uh, of the same period, uh, which depicted the lives of saints, the synagogue of those uh, centuries do not exalt individual or patrons, but stress the passage for of time and expression of the divine creation. This was expressed <coughs> even more prominently in the, in the Middle Ages. This is the cathedral in Gerish, in Gerish, but this is, we see it, the Amiens Cathedral in, uh, in France, and we see here the transept and the direction of the, pre of the, the people coming to the, to the church and the dome on the center that scattered a beautiful light before seeing the crucifix. It's a very is directed to a vanishing prospective point. This was not what happened in the synagogues. We see here in the Regensburg synagogue, this is a, a sort, excuse me, this is a sort of, uh, uh, of division in two, not in three like the, the church, in three uh, names. Here we have two names. It's anti-performance. Uh, anti we see people sitting here couldn't even see the, the Holy Ark. We see it in, a, uh, in the Regensburg Twin Eyes Synagogue engraving of the interior. You see here is the lectern and the, the Holy Ark is on the end but you don't see it. People were sitting around the lectern, hearing uh, the, the, the uh, cantor, hearing the rabbi uh, preaching and the, lec uh, the, the, the lecture that he gave them. And this is a totally different way of uh, using the space. The same is in the synagogue of Kadimir's in Krakow, and uh, if you want also the synagogue of the Nachmanides in the old city uh, that has a, a row of pillars looking towards east. Here we have two uh, holy arcs, but this is a modern solution. In the ori origin there was no, uh, not at all any arc here in this synagogue because there was not a direction to look at. I'm moving to Renaissance, especially the Baroque, are characterized by the illusion of prospective spaces and illustration of the heavens that seem to pull the worshipper up into them while angels flutter their wings and are down upwards uh, alongside them Another common theme is the uh, portrait of the Madonna. You see, here we, you can see the, the, the sky is open the, and you see, can see also the Madonna which see, uh, stimulate viewers with their seductive femininity. Contemporary in synagogues did not include any of these elements. I believe the travel didn't accept it. But uh, even in an uh, impressive synagogue like that in Kazale, we can see here it's written Ze Shara Shamayim, but this is not Shara Shamayim as in the church. It's totally different. 
Here you see the Shemaim, the, the, the heavens. Here you don't see heaven, it's only written. You have to understand it. But you have in Kazale beautiful uh, 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 Baroque details, but nothing of the, the um, uh, heaven looking is the typical to the church. And we see it in other places, the Montaigne. And uh, on the other side, you find uh, holy arts that are very typical to Baroque, but, and they are similar uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, altars in the churches. This church uh, in uh, Capella Vendramin in Venice that have been designed by the same architect that they designed the uh, holy ark of the Spanish synagogue. And, but uh, what is very interesting is a space that anticipated the, the holy, uh, the, the, this altar, and in the synagogue, it only, it, it was flattened. It was not a space, it was something very, very di two-dimensional instead of this uh, profound uh, chapel of uh, Vendramin. Uh, I want to touch also the synagogues in Asia Minor. Uh, this synagogue that we see here, here is the senior synagogue uh, and uh, in, in, uh, in Bursa. We see here a very interesting point. There is a lectern here for sublime prayers, for reading the Torah, and on the other side we have a small uh, lectern here. What is the difference between the two lecterns? And here is another synagogue in Bursa. Uh, the, the, uh, and you see here the, the upper le uh, lectern and the lower lectern. And then there is also the Holy Ark. What was the difference between them? Because in the synagogue, the, uh, the cantor have a, a very specific, important uh, task of reading the very sublime prayer. But they have also another place for the hymnist, a python, that was sitting down and he was surrounded by, uh, by uh, uh, all you see here, surrounded by the, the, the congregation that were taking place, taking part of the uh, liturgy. They were also singing according to what the hymnist was giving them to say. So there is a participation of all the public, not one person that was creating the new, uh, the way of praying. They were praying themselves. And uh, Mantegna, uh, Dome in uh, in uh, Paragon with uh, uh, with uh, uh, this dome in the in the synagogue in uh, Turkey, and here we see another sky in a church, totally different, and here on the other side the synagogue of Ahrida in uh, Istanbul with two lecterns, the upper one and the lower one. The same in Cochin, uh, the, the upper lectern and the, the lower lectern. This is a totally different way of praying that we know in Ashkenaz. I want to touch also this kind of four pillars synagogue. Every one of you knows this uh, page of the sister of the Golden Agada, and uh, uh, you see it is, the, the lectern is inside, in between four pillars. Four pillars, here you have 
the holy ark. It's not the entrance. It's the holy ark, and uh, you can uh, see that. This is the Holy Ark, a Spanish Holy Ark of the same time of this Agada. So you, you can see clearly that the Agada was telling us about a synagogue and not a, a, a normal room. And this is a synagogue with four pillars of uh, um, uh, Tomar in Portugal. In between the pillars, something was happening. Rudolf spoke about it. You even couldn't see the, the, the Chazan. He was uh, surrounded by pillars. This is the, the synagogue of Bergama in, uh, in Turkey. And you see four pillars and the Chazan in, in between. And the pillars are holding the, the roof of the synagogue. It happens naturally also in Poland, and uh, we see also the Tikochin. This is the Lvov synagogue, and this is the Tikochin synagogue, and the Chazan is uh, surrounded by pillars. The Holy Ark is almost not existing. The most important place is the center, is the center of the liturgy. The same happened in the Novgorod uh, churches, but the, the inside the four pillars was the holy fire, not a, a lectern, not a place of words. It was a very um, uh, abstract moment in the church, different totally from what happened in the very, um, uh, very realistic space in the synagogue. Another type of synagogues are the beautiful synagogue in the uh, in the Asian world. This is a synagogue in Baghdad, surrounded. It, it's a court, open air court, surrounded by chapels, and the chapels was every chapel was a synagogue, a small synagogue, and in, in the holidays or in Shabbat. All the synagogues were creating a wonderful choir of I'm finishing a, a wonderful choir of uh, the entire synagogue. The, this is uh, very typical to Central Asia, a different way of thinking about synagogues. I want to finish. It was only emancipation that the Jewish people tried to imitate the Christian cathedrals. Rudolf, you spoke about it. This, uh, however, this synagogue, even when new, were left half empty. Mute monuments for a Judaism that once existed and was now vanishing. Presently, under the influence of Jewish community centers in the United States and similar facilities in Israel, the synagogue <coughs> has regained its functional dimension and original characteristic. Thank you. Often we use three, not often actually, 
several times a year we use three Sifrei Torah, so there should be actually three of those in every synagogue. Do you have any evidence that there were many more or at least one more in one of those synagogues? Like if you showed the one from... <coughs> you know it better than I do. <coughs> from from uh, Kabbalah. You were showing them... Yeah, yeah. Just like in the Torah arc, and I'm looking for the possibility of having a third one, if your theory is correct, or the one you quoted, that uh, they preceded the existence of a construction of the Torah. Um, I don't know. I know that we found two such things in the museum, and I, it, it's funny. I wanted to say that basically, but we know about Jews in Siberia, about synagogues in Siberia, much less than every show knows about 20th century Cologne. Uh, so we don't know, uh, have interior photograph, only these two which I showed. We found these things in the museum. Um, so we found two. We found two. Yeah. No. It's very simple. Uh, it, you can find them in Italy, in French, everywhere. When uh, in the festival it happened that you bring out from the Holy Ark not one uh, separate Torah, but two or sometimes even three. Uh, if you say Hanukkah, yeah. Rosh Chodesh, and so on, and Shabbat, it's three separate Torah. You don't open every time the Holy Ark. You take out three separate Torah and you have one to be used and other two to uh, attend their time. So you put them inside these uh, chairs, if you can say, these thrones, and uh, they, they attend their moment to be open. That's the reason. This is, we know it's in Italy and in France. But we don't know to Western Europe, uh, no such as the European thing. Uh, this, uh, this is the moment they arrive to the conclusion. In Chita. Huh? In Chita. In Chita. Yeah. In Chita. Yeah. 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 I, I also think that this is the usage, but where, uh, so well, we have one photograph with two such uh, mm. uh, 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 supports, uh, uh, and the third Torah scroll, we're speaking of three scrolls, the third scroll on the photograph. This line on the beam. Yeah, that, so, the three, so I think the photograph shows us the uh, reading from the Torah, mm -hmm. uh, from the one scroll and two are waiting as uh, David is saying. But a text, suppose, with what is wooden supports which are replaced by the ark? No, no. Yeah, because the, the, the Torah scroll cannot be. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm surprised by myself. The text says, wooden support were raised by art. What is it? Mistake? Yeah. There is an entire article yeah. that the Southern Nations wrote about, about it. Italy, not about Eastern Europe. This is, this is the, the same practice is in the Eastern Europe and in Italy and in France. They have to ex ex uh, take out three separate or so uh, they have to pu put them somewhere. And this is the place. Okay. It's a practical solution. Yes. And, and then you, it mustn't be that a, a person from Italy came to, to Siberia. It's a possibility. They read an article about it. Okay. Okay. More questions. We have enough time. Yes. I have another question regarding to this kind of choice. I don't know whether Felicitas uh, is in. Have you seen her? Yes, yes. Oh, please. We discussed these large fire clouds and the heavy torn shields. And I think that's the solution. If you have these chairs where you can put them on display, then it's possible that you have also these heavy, heavy crowns that we have from Budapest and we have it from Prague and elsewhere, which are so heavy that it's hardly to imagine that you can take, put them on a scroll, like in Ash Western Ashkenaz, Minar Grenus, and uh, just conduct them around uh, the community and hold it in your arms during uh, service until their turn comes. But if you have the chairs, 
That fits all together in other stories. That's right. <laughs> But have a look at what's happening in Amsterdam, where they have very, very heavy limonin, and, and which is why they probably invented Latin limonin. But if you look at uh, the depictions of the consecration of the Portuguese synagogue, you see them using these enormous Torah scrolls, on top of which they have enormous Torah decorations. Right. So I'm not sure they all arrive at the same conclusion all over the Jewish world. I think really what we discussed yesterday was it was a case that these are ornamentations which had <coughs> I'm sorry, it's so freezing in here. <laughs> it's the, the, the problem that the ornamentation is it's not only that the, the the ornaments are I mean weigh like ten kilos of silver and I simply can't imagine how you manage that. But further, that the ornamentation is so clearly a message to an, to an official because you have the, you know, the Hungarian hardcore crown on it and all these codes that clearly tell the viewer, oh, look here, we are so awesome, or we are so it's royal, so we are it's so... It's as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, 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 I mean, the queen, yeah. the queen attends... Yeah, 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 in right, this right, right. Yeah, yeah, it was the same. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think that uh, Hans Jürgen, or it was earlier Hans, uh, the first attending, but his officials or his uh, police guides, they attended. Yeah, they, I mean, sneaked around and spied, and they wanted, I mean, and the Jews wanted to send out the, spread the message, okay, we are. Um, we are prepared to be emancipated because we are loyal Catholics to the to the empire. Yeah, but then these chairs would serve a double function. Yeah, but I don't know, you know, if at that time in the Dini for the Stadt Temple in Vienna was created, there were two chairs. I mean, I don't know if one can really easily compare the situation. But I think in one of your slides, one of those chairs does show two spikes for the limonin. I'm Am I correct? No. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you Don't show the slide if I'm incorrect. Okay, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's decoration. It's decoration. In one of them, I thought I saw. Yeah, they were, yeah, they, from uh, from uh, afar, the look, but yeah. they okay. definitely. They're didn't. just different. Yeah. of the 19th century cathedral synagogues. Now, personally, I also don't particularly enjoy worshipping in them myself, unless there's a big society wedding. But nevertheless, I want to stand up in defense of these synagogues. And all, I don't think we have to personally like them, but I think as scholars, uh, I would like to suggest that that uh, this ch these changes were almost necessary because of the changes uh, in the Jewish community in the 19th century. And I pick up on Paula Hyman's book, uh, Gender and Assimilation in the 19th Century. Uh, and I've spoken about gender before. I will speak about gender again. The synagogues, the traditional synagogues, had one major problem which I think didn't work for 19th century ideas of sociability middle class respectability and synagogue attendance as a family. Uh, and that is that I think the space for the women was unsatisfactory. Even the 17th century synagogues that had ladies galleries, there were all sorts of problems. And in some ways, this cross between a cathedral and an opera house that you find in Berlin Town, in Berlin and you know, in some of the other great Style synagogues solved this problem that the kind of way in which people wanted to attend as middle class or aspiring to middle class or even upper middle class families uh, made, you know, was, was possible in that way. Whereas even the 17th century, uh, as Rat Machine with its grilled kind of, you know, sort of, it, it just didn't.
didn't, it clashed with the sensibility of the 19th century. And I think Excuse that's what me, it had to happen. But the women in those synagogues had to go up three stories. Yeah. And yeah. it was terrible for the old women. Yeah. It was, yeah. I can tell you one thing. I come no, from... I'm not saying that it's an improvement. I come from Florida. From this synagogue that you mentioned. Yeah. Done by Trellis. And uh, my grandparents were not going to this, they call it the terrible synagogue. <laughs> they were, were going to the old synagogue, not in the ghetto, because the ghetto was not there, but the synagogue that came after the ghetto. Very small synagogue, very enclosed, very uh, personal, personal synagogue. And they couldn't go there. I grew up with the knowledge that the, those were the terrible things. And uh, they were Mudekar, they were wonderful. Today I know that they are really beautiful uh, buildings. But they were well, without I'm people. I'm just proposing that to approach it by ways of philosophy and style is of course very important. But I think that we also need to think about the social history that underlies it and the social changes. Uh, and again, gender is part of it. And very often, the medieval two-lane synagogues uh, are shown, for example, without the, you know, the women's edition. So that the question of how the synagogue was gendered as a building is also not always addressed. You know, sometimes it's sort of taken away and purified. And I think that's how it's easy to forget what the 19th century required and why the, okay, you know, I was, you know, the Tempio Maggiore, in, I lived in Rome, the Tempio yeah. Maggiore, yeah, it's very high up, and, you know, if you're a lady above a certain age, it's a pain in the neck to have to climb up there. That's a point. But those, that seemed to be the price that, that they were prepared to Because you are a woman, we all have to go up uh, three flats. So and if uh, you are a man, you are very, very <laughs> good <laughs> situation. Uh, anyway, I'm just provoking. I think it's worth thinking about a little bit more. Mm -hmm. attention that you mentioned Karl Marx, but he wrote also um, exactly on this thing about the Florence and I recall he you know I'm going to look at because there he describes with the documents of community itself it was a very prolonged discussion whether to accept Mudeha or not to accept it was more imposed from outside the community wanted us to renaissance not to stick out in the that's what I want to yeah. ask you. Yeah. So at the end, yeah. there was some kind of compromise because it's not yeah. typical Modeha. Like if you look at Modeha, you could see some very big difference, right? So they managed to preserve some kind of half Byzantine, you know, central plan that is more close to local Renaissance architecture with round also arches and more inside was the Not necessarily. Look at the Bodefest. Bodefest yes. looks much more oriental also from outside. It has nothing to do with the floor plan. Yeah. It's deconstructed. <laughs> <laughs> it's because of a long discussion inside the community. And Karma brings lots of documentation, you know, the research papers of the community. And then this article is going to really come along and you know, back and forth until they decide to really to go for it. And as I said, there was more imposed than just the community. Mm -hmm. Rudo, you don't, didn't mention the wonderful synagogue of Otto Wagner, that you wrote about it. it it's not the same kind of synagogue <laughs> like <laughs> that of Johan. <laughs> it's not, it's not Johan. No. It's a problematic building if you refer to the Otto Wagner synagogue. Um, it has an orthogonal plan, which is very odd for a synagogue, so it's better not to touch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we will turn them back to the ark, because it's an orthogonal going all, all along, you know, yeah, like yeah. that. 
So we will now facing the, the Rima and turning it back to the, to the R. So I, I don't want to tackle mm -hmm. this building. Although it was a springboard for Otto Wagner, it was his first major uh, building. And it made him famous. It made him, made him famous. Yeah, and, and moreover, he acquired steel. So it's not a reconstructed construction. <laughs> no, it, it has a lot of mistakes, but it's yeah. not a construction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is it restored now? Is it happening? Um, it is open, but it will not be restored. And I'm afraid when they restore it, that it's not going to be the same. You know what happened to the dog? It's a Barbie, Barbie uh, uh, pink color inside, and it was green and blue and brown. But politically, it wasn't really you know, okay, acceptable. The green is, you know. And, and there were some problems, so they decided to keep the pink. pink. pink you need the characters to come and do something. Uh, it is particularly a, a good in terms of my so it's the one to be invited. Any more questions? You know, well, everybody knows that this interrelation between the liturgy, theology, and the shape of a Christian church, either Western or Eastern, it was not coined in one moment. It was a long, long historical process where this interrelation was formed. And it was also due uh, an hierarchical structure of the church that we, the Jews, are missing. Do you think that this deconstruction starts there, or it's something inherent, or what just just there was not in, not enough time to produce this hierarchy or this liturgy connected to the shape? What, what happened? To yeah, you you put two questions. Um, there was enough time, um, just the clustered column in the nine bay uh, has had a, a lifespan uh, of, of 300 years at least. Yeah? So there was enough time to, to develop it, yeah? and it didn't. So, um, and it is even an, an issue whether the clustered column was further, the columns are closer to each other, and which was the evolutional line you can prove uh, either or. So there is no answer that perhaps the equal spans were first and then the unequal spans or the way around. It depends which country you are uh, uh, researching. So it, 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 it is a chronology. The, the clustered columns are, say, <coughs> 30, 30, no, earlier, some 30 years earlier in Poland, and they, they, they emerged there. But Mikulov? Mikulov is much, much later, but it, it so was built first. To say first in, in Przemysl, Lublin probably, because it was reconstructed. But the first nine bay, real nine bay, was uh, 1624 Lvov and 1627 Ostrov. This is the span. And it was then parallel, because Lutz is clustered and it's uh, 1626. It is parallel to Ostrov, the same area. And then... Uh, those Belarusian symbols were built clustered. So that, then it becomes parallel, parallel, all the time being. <laughs> so probably this is your answer to your question, because it means that uh, they didn't want to change, actually. Mm -hmm. It was a sort of uh, a codification. Probably your theory, I subscribe to your theory of Villa Alpando, that uh, impacted um, the Renaissance impact on synagogues. It came to follow there are many evidences. So this is probably the main line, and the hookah theory is very problematic. Although for some um, timber uh, synagogues, the hookah theory and the Mikulov uh, may apply, because these columns are so thin, slender, that uh, probably there is no static role. So they have a symbolic role. And if they have a symbolic role, then it goes closer to this idea of the Zohar and, and the interpretation. Yeah. But all these clustered columns appeared before Vidal Pando wrote his book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you take Tomar, it was, it was before. Yeah, yeah well, but Tomar is it's an under a mice, let's say. Yeah. 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 Venus is 1597. Venus is 30. Lublin. Ah, Lublin is 70, but it, it's yeah. the real form it was reconstructed in the 19th yeah. century. Yeah. Nobody yeah. knows what it exactly yeah. was. Yeah. It's, it's difficult it's to discuss it. Who, who yeah, yeah, but yeah. It's, it's difficult to know what it, yeah. what it actually was. Yeah. So 
So probably there was no need, you know, so it was so suitable in, in very many ways that there, there was no need to change it. Okay. One more. I would like to ask Helena. Can you I would like to ask Helena if, um, I mean, uh, if you deal, for example, in comparison uh, to uh, Florence and Toledo um, with the Turkish temple in Vienna, well, I actually I, I started last year with a PhD in research, and so I concentrated more on the Spanish synagogue than on the European. And um, I'm still looking for the examples I should prove. And I thought about the Magdeburg uh, synagogue, the Turin synagogue, the Florentine synagogue, and I might also uh, take it out from the synagogue you, you mentioned. So first. Uh, Definitely in theory, yes. Yeah, but I think I think the year this one is really some. I mean, in the synagogue that was modeled, I mean, that was modeled according to really to uh, to um, no. Stephanie, I had the thing in front. Yeah. To the Alhambra. To the Alhambra. synagogue interior, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's the interior too. The interior, but I mean, in that case, I think in the Viennese case, it's more than the interior. It's more it's than not the interior, but the idea is to have a comprehensive stylistic model applied to a building uh, to design a specific Jewish origin. The first time it happened was Semper. It's, it's 1841. Yes. And it, it, it's it's true. It's only the interior because it was conceived at the time Jones was just on the market, uh, and Semper, of course, knew yeah. what 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 was it about, and did so. And I think the next step is to convert it from the inside to the outside. And I think there you're right that uh, the temple is in Vienna is the first example of that. Yeah. But it's in the fifth. In the beginning of the fifth. No, 53. Right, right. No, it's even later. It's 80. It's 80. The question? Leopold? Leopold? It's not a little. I don't know about the Leopold temple. Oh, it's very different. I mean, this is really modeled. I mean, the model was Alhambra, and not only from the inside, but also from the outside. And it was a clearly, clearly multi-cell I mean, it most perfect Mutia building I know outside of Al Andalus, so to say. Yeah. So, so and therefore I was just curious if you would consider it as a uh, piece uh, to be compared or to, to be reflected upon because nobody takes it. Everybody talks about Förster and the temple <laughs> and nobody talks about the uh, Zirkuskassen temple as it was. As a Turkish temple. Yeah, that which was in the Zirkuskassen. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just about uh, one more thing about the symbol in Florence. Uh, it's uh, uh, really interesting uh, uh, how uh, the discourse uh, draw our attention to really uh, minor uh, uh, modish elements in, in this building. Uh, uh, I would think also about the role of the great dome and the, this synagogue in the skyline of the city. Uh, wonderful scene from Piazza Michelangelo, for example, and uh, reflecting uh, or echoing Santa uh, 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 So it's another statement, a very strong statement of uh, all these buildings in the skyline. So it's very interesting. It's, uh, but, 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 all this, uh, also, the plan, the plan is a different time. Yeah, yes, yes.